11, 12, 13, 14. We're rolling. He's going to jump in. We'll start asking you first question. All right, Virginia, could you tell us about 34 strike? What do you remember? Well, I remember very did a lot about it for the reason that we drove very often from Washington to Montgomery, and we drove through North Carolina and we drove through Kannapolis and Concord and. Uh, in fact, every little textile village we came through, we saw the same uh, situation, which was that the National Guard was occupying the city of the town. The strike was on, the, the uh, mills were closed, and uh, there was just like an armed camp. There would be a machine gun, you know, at every corner of the uh, mill, and there'd be the uh, National Guard in the streets. and. The mill people would be usually in groups gathered together somewhere, and it was frightening and it was very terrifying indeed. And uh, we would try to find ways of getting around the villages, but it was very difficult because uh, you know, there were no roads that went around those little villages. But that was true. Of, I can't remember exactly the names of all the places, but it was true all through North Carolina. There was a textile strike that took in the whole state, as I recall. What did you think about that as a, as a middle class person who didn't have anything to do with textiles? Well, I thought it was absolutely disgraceful because the, uh, the conditions in the mills I thought was disgraceful. And uh, I thought for them to call out the National Guard to break the strike was absolutely disgraceful. See, I was a great New Deal in those days and still am, I suppose. But, uh, the, New Deal, and you see, the labor labor had been made legal under Roosevelt. I mean, the unionization of labor, and uh, up until that time, it had uh, no protection, whatever. So I thought that they were uh, the being not only uh, dangerous but also being illegal. I mean, then calling out the guard. They did that all over the South, though, because where I lived in Birmingham, Alabama. They called out the National Guard for the coal strikes. And so you see, the, at that time, the South was almost entirely un, not ununionized and not unionized, except for very special skilled crafts like the bricklayers or the carpenters that may have a union. But the uh, thing that was such a, always such a puzzle to me and that I never have yet uh, really you know, discovered why is that uh, the National Guard is mostly made up of uh, just the run and file, I mean, you know, the rank and file of people, not an elite organization. And now it's become uh, extremely integrated because uh, it, today they get $138 every time they go out to train. And a lot of women join because of the $138. And as you know, about 30% of the people in the Gulf are now black because they usually join often for the $138 too. And now those people, of course, are being sent well to Saudi Arabia to fight. But the point about the National Guard was that so often the very people who were in the National Guard were also people who worked in the mills. And I always thought that was very strange that the people who worked in the mills they had been coerced into performing the act of breaking up the union. No, very puzzling. We've been talking with some of the cotton mill workers about being called lint heads. Did you hear anything about oh, that? Oh, heavens, yes. Uh, you see, they had a big mill in Birmingham, the Coma family, the Avondale Mills, and they lived in a certain part of town. And I can remember very plainly, uh, you know, uh, the children particularly. We called them uh, lint heads. That was because, you know, the cotton. But it, what we thought that it meant was that they were all were extremely blonde. They had uh, pale eyelashes and pale eyebrows and pale hair and pale skins. And uh, at that time, I was so unconscious of the uh, facts of life that I just thought they were born that way. But of course, it was really malnutrition. And, but the, you could always tell a cotton mill child. And uh, it was very uh, painful to, when I think of how looked down on they were. They uh, 
you know, you just say it like somebody had a, you know, some sort of wound, a scar. Well, that's just a cotton mill job. And that's the way they were regarded. And the people in the mills were regarded that way too, as you know. And of course, the thing that about the people in the mills that came down out of the mountains particularly, but usually the people that came off the farms, oh, we thought those little villages were you know, terrible little houses, just as I say like, and uh, all kind of squinched up together. But uh, they were crazy about it because they had uh, running water and they had electricity, and they never had that before in their lives because uh, they thought that was wonderful. And you see, it took a really long time before they ever got a nerve to strike. I mean, they went on for years and years and years. And now the thing that's so sad is that they've all gone. They've all gone. I mean, the textile trade's gone to Taiwan or Korea, and all those textile mills are just shutting up. Little towns are dying. Now, did you associate with the the families of the employers, like the Comers and the Callaways and so forth? Well, I suppose I did. I uh, went to school with the Comers, and uh, they went to public school with me. One of them was a dear friend, and uh, but I never thought any more about them as employers. You know, that was after I was grown. Uh, I just thought they were neighbors, you know, and they lived in the same neighborhood. But uh, now I never met the Calloways the last summer, and that was rather amusing because uh, the Calloways, you know, were terrifically stern with their help, and they uh, always thought of themselves as benevolent paternalist. And of course, they had those wonderful gardens, you know, the Calloway gardens. So last summer, I was Jane, uh, Lady Bird Johnson has a house that Mother's been in every summer. And so last summer she had a house, and uh, she uh, had all of her wildflower friends. So I uh, went to the dinner party to meet them, a big party she had, and one of them was Mrs. Calloway, and Mrs. Calloway, and they were the Calloways from Calloway Gardens in LaGrange, Georgia. But they now live in uh, Colorado and have a ski lodge. And. Uh, they talked about the Callaway Gardens, but we never mentioned the Callaway Mills. But he also ran, you know, for Summerfield, I believe, and got beat. But, uh, well, you know, it was <laughs> the uh, marvelous, uh, because the queen, uh, the king of the daffodils was there. And Mr. Callaway, I think, is known as one of the great horticulturists in the field of azaleas. But you went to Lady Bird Johnson's house for dinner and you didn't talk about anything but flowers. <laughs> <laughs> now, you are, you are pretty knowledgeable about Southern history. How do you feel uh, about the preservation of the history of the textile industry almost entirely in terms of the, the big houses and the big mills? Well, I think it's extremely interesting because it was the beginning of industrialization. Uh, up to that time, you see, the South had been almost entirely an agricultural part of the country. And uh, I think the textile mills came in, and they were, as my knowledge goes, which is not as expert as you might think, but as my knowledge goes, the, the textile industry was the first in industry that took root in the South. Of course, in Birmingham, the coal mines uh, started pretty early, too. But the textile industry was really the southern industry that was, and uh, see, it was a f almost entirely due to the north. And then uh, many of these mills were owned by the northerners because they wanted to get back down closer to where the cotton was grown. And uh, it was only after so many years, really many years, that the southern money came into it. It was usually northern money that ran the mills. But um, the industrialization, I mean the unionization of the mills, uh, came many years after the uh, industry had been uh, running. And uh, the workers were not dissatisfied until sometime in 
where we're in the New Deal days is the first time I remember them having terrible strikes and getting all waked up. And uh, it, they'd really at that time be got awful mad. And I always had a strange suspicion, which of course I can't prove, so you probably get rid of is there were some people in the textile unions who were working against the union, who were actually trying to get uh, dissension. One of them was Roy Lawrence, I thought was a very bad fella, but he had a terrible red bait in the first place. And uh, then I thought there was something sort of shady about him that he was in there for other ulterior purposes. Now, Lucy Mason wasn't in the Textile Workers Union at that time. Uh, no, she never she was. Lucy Randolph Mason, as you know, was uh, got connected with the union movement. Uh, I know all that very well because uh, I was living up in Virginia, you know, in the Isle of Alexandria when I met her. And uh, she was brought to my house to meet me because I happened to be a great friend of Catherine Lewis, who was John L. Lewis's daughter, who was a rather large lady who was a very brilliant woman. And uh, she was very anxious. Her sister, see, they were there, the, the aristocrats of the aristocrats. I mean, you couldn't go any higher in Virginia than the uh, Randolphs or the Masons. She was both, you know, Lucy Randolph and Mason. And you see that George Mason lived right down there on the Potomac, right below Alexandria. So her sister had married uh, somebody named Brian, who was head of the bank in Alexandria. And uh, she was quite a society leader. And uh, so Lucy uh, used to visit her sister, and she was working with the YWCA and uh, she had gotten very upset and disturbed about the condition of the girls who worked in the tobacco factories. She thought they were treated very badly and she thought they were paid very little. And so her sister brought her to see me to see if I could get her an introduction to John L. Lewis, which I was managed to do through his daughter, Catherine. Well, she just uh, bowled Mr. John L. Lewis over because she was such a southern lady, you know, she just absolutely a very epitome of a Virginia lady. She just wore little white collars and looked so pretty and dainty and sweet. And he sent her south his, his uh, you know, re publicity representative. And uh, she, <laughs> people would say that she uh, walked into any office, you know, editor's office, the head of the mills or whatever she was doing, and then all the men instinctively rose and took off their hats. <laughs> Just looking at Miss Lucy, they rise up and take off the hat. And she was really a lovely, sweet lady. She was, uh, but she was so, you know, so completely uh, out of character. If you could. There were two people, you know, that started the Southern Conference, and she was one, and the other one was Joe Gelders. He was the same way. I mean, he was just such the epitome of a Southern gentleman, you know, extremely. So the radical movement of the South started with the descendant of George Mason and young Jewish physics professor who uh, descended from Abraham, I reckon. When did, you, when did you go to Washington? Well, we went to Washington in 1933. See, my brother-in-law, Justice Black, who was a senator. And uh, so my father fell on evil times uh, when cotton went down to five cents a pound after the First World War. He lost all of his land and had to sell it for nothing. And he couldn't even pay the taxes. And uh, so I had to come home from college. And uh, then I married. And uh, Cliff was working for the Alabama Power Company. It was a leaf law for him. And then uh, Hugo Black asked if he'd like to come to Washington when the banks were closed. They were looking, and you know, the banks were all shut all over the country. And, they were looking for lawyers who, uh, corporate lawyers who could deal with the banks. So uh, he wasn't terribly happy at the Alabama Power Company because uh, he was in a rather ambiguous position there. Uh, my brother-in-law, Hugo Black, was fighting tooth and toenail for the TVA. You can imagine how popular that <laughs> with the Alabama Power Company. And so Cliff was <laughs> frequently reproached for having a brother-in-law for the TVA. So he saw things were not going to be happy. And so we seized upon the chance of getting to Washington. 
and we went to Washington in 1933, and he immediately began working with the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, opening up the banks. Now, I was asking about that because the climate in Washington seemed to have been very pro-labor as you look back on it, but uh, the textile people, textile workers, were having a hard time getting the right kind of government support for this strike. Well, you see, one of the reasons the textile workers uh, did as uh, bad as they did, in a way, uh, I mean, I certainly felt sorry for them, and uh, I think they were, but they were very racist people. Uh, the Texas workers never allowed in the union a black person, and uh, they never tried to keep them out of the industry entirely. And they were extremely racist, and they uh, were very, uh, uh, and they, they never got much support, they never got any support from the black people because uh, they were so racist. And it's that streak you see that keeps the South down today, like Governor Hunt of Alabama. Here you have, you know, big, rich Republicans, millionaires and so forth, and then they have this uh, primitive Baptist preacher who is practically illiterate, but he's a racist, and so he got elected with the millionaire vote and the uh, poor white trash vote. Now that's quite a strange combination, but he got elected just the same. And you're associating the textile workers with poor white trash. <laughs> You make me seem more of a snob than I really am. Uh, but if you want to know the truth of the matter, I did associate textile waste with the poor white trash. And I thought that, the, you know, I, I thought that they were born that way. And I hate to admit it, but that's exactly what I thought. But now I was young. See, I learned different as I got older. George, you've got to admit I tried. <laughs> Okay, I think we've got everything we need to have this lady. That's a perfect confession. <laughs> well, <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> well, you see, the thing I'm trying to explain was that the reason they didn't have so much political, uh, because in the first place, they were terrible red baiters, the textual union was. In the second place, they were racist, too. So that did sort of cut off a lot of political support they might have had that they didn't get. Absolutely. Nobody else has had the, the guts to say that. And I think well, it was absolutely, it's absolutely true. I don't know why nobody said it. It's just it's, it couldn't be true. I, I wonder if, um, Virginia, if you have anything you'd like to add about the women who were involved in the strike, the women textile workers and their involvement in the strike. Honey, I never knew a woman was actually trying to work in my life. Uh, yeah, not on a personal basis. And, uh, and I see, I, it's, it's, I, it's so strange to try to explain. Uh, I lived in very close association with blacks all my life from the time I was born. I mean, intimate association. I slept and ate and played and, you know, everything except go to school. But I never had any association with poor whites at all. And I can remember them now, you know, uh, they'd come over the mountains on Saturday and uh, they'd go, they were walking. This was the ones that worked in the iron ore mines and the coal mines and they'd come back home at night drunk and they were reeling. And I can hear my mother now saying, oh, poor white trash, <laughs> you know, you just absolutely can't do a thing with them. You can't imagine how you're raised in the South and if you're just, uh, you know, uh, you get you're indoctrinated in a class system. You have to just get over it like you get over the measles or the mumps or the avoid fever. Well, George, you're a fine one to talk to. You were stony from Charleston. <laughs> Good God, you have a whole lot more aristocratic than we were, so I don't know why you look at me. Oh, the Stonies, phew! If you didn't, you, I bet your family even went to that damn ball. What was the name of that ball? If you went to that, you were certified. What was the name of that ball in Charleston? Oh, you do know. Everybody knows. If you got invited to that ball, you were certified. 100% pure, blue-blooded all the way through. And you don't even remember the name of no, it? No, you're, you're associating it with the family, the branch of the family that was very distant from mine. The Stoners in Charleston? They've only been 
It's only a convenience when I need to get somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as I know, I was raised on the fact that Stoner is about as aristocratic as you can get. <laughs> okay, I think. Virginia, you, you, you were just great. You were the of the I've never heard of. <laughs> Who are these people? I'd like to go meet them. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the name's Stoney. I promise you, it's going to be more than 15 minutes. Is that it? Okay, <laughs> packing up. That's good. That's it?